All right, let's move on to our uh, next topic. Not our final topic. We have a couple more. Uh, the, the collective bargaining agreement has been agreed upon. Finally, it's been solved. Well, tentatively. But it, it looks like to be done. Fingers crossed. Yeah. And, and, and Major League Baseball was after five years or so, it's around every five years, that they have to renegotiate uh, between the owners and the Players Association. And this year, I, there's been some changes and some notable ones especially within uh, the All-Star Game and the disabled list and some um, uh, free agent compensation. So we're going to dive into that a little bit. I was really excited this morning, so I was like, all right, we have to talk about this on the show. Absolutely. Um, first of all, guys, I want to get your reactions on the All-Star Game not meaning anything anymore. It uh, No more home field advantage for the winner. Mark, what do you think? Well, uh, if you've listened to me on various podcasts, you know I don't like any All-Star game ever. I think All-Star <laughs> games are the most pointless thing out there. They're fun when you're a kid and like it's got all the stars, because really that's probably all you know. Uh, the All-Star games are always pointless. They really aren't. People don't want to play that hard. Um, I just like skill competitions. You know, so for me, it's like, yeah, all right, pure we got entertainment a, value. Yeah, exactly. Just give me the 110% entertainment. Give me the home run derby, and that's really all I care about when it comes to it. Maybe I'll be interested to see who can throw a fastball the, the uh, I fastest. I mean, Raldis Chapman kind of wins that. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, we can already know that by it's just like looking at the stats. Uh, I'm with you, though. Like, it's, I don't know. I think the All-Star game in baseball, when it had value of being that uh, deciding factor, it's hard to tell guys on, like, the Twins, the Royals, those mm-hmm. I mean, the roles have been better, but the the bottom level teams in the league that you decide who gets the advantage in the World Series, yeah. that's kind of outrageous. Right. But I mean, it was kind of nice trying to watch people try their hardest playing, you know, balls to the walls. And the, I mean, it's best against best. You're watching like some of them were extremely close games. The one that ended in a tie, I just I don't even want to acknowledge. That was what was that 2003, 2000. 2004, 2003. Is it baseball? When they oh, ran out of players. In I mean, yeah, yeah. Seven, seven. Yeah, no, and that's a really good point, uh, Dave, that you brought up is the quality of play. Yeah, it's there, but everybody is represented from every, uh, one player has to be represented from every team in Major yep. League Baseball. So that doesn't make the game credible if it means something so much. Now, for the Cubs' sake, I think they don't win the World Series if this rule was implemented because. Obviously, they benefited from the DH there in Game Seven, and obviously, in hindsight, you could say, "Oh, the series would have went a different way." It's the anti-Schwarber rule, right? If the if the that's Cubs what we should refer home, to it as, yeah. It was. Oh my gosh, mm-hmm. uh, we could reminisce about the Cubs World Series <laughs> when all we want. But going back to this World Series conversation uh, in regards to the All Star Game, managers didn't manage the All Star Game as if it meant something. They managed it traditionally how All Star Games are. You have representatives play specific amount of innings, and then you get the bench players in, and you just keep rotating guys in until they run out and then they tie you know, yeah. and, and then tie so really it didn't make sense for a team with the best record in baseball to not have home field advantage in the most important series of really their entire lives right and then you move on looking at the all-star game and you have guys from the twins like you said with 50, uh, 60 wins on the year having players representing a game that means nothing to them but something to the their respective leagues so it just didn't make sense to me from the beginning, why I get it, but see, like, was like, yeah, oh, we want people to be entertained by this All Star game. We want it to mean something. This time it counts. I mean, they saw they saw what happened to the Pro Bowl and the NBA one. Or it's just kind of like, yeah, it's there as a showcase for our you know our players, but you can't have guys going out there and like lobbing like sixty mile an hour you know fastballs. I mean, we cause. saw in the NBA they almost scored two hundred points right, this right. year. Like it, one team gets out of cra- it gets out of hand very easily. I mean, what are we gonna do? Aluminum bats in the uh, All Star game? They kill wiffle someone. Ball. It, it's a wiffle ball. Like, That'd be fun. I mean, you I you jokingly before the podcast started mentioned the uh, the celebrity softball game. Yeah, and that, like that, there's something fun. that at least is fun. Like yep. it's it's interesting. I mean, one of the few times people care about golf is that big celebrity golf tournament. That's true. I mean, and that's all this seems to become for them. It's it's a giant marketing weekend for yeah. the oh, MLB. Yeah. So for, why not? Yeah, any. Why not just go all out and like include you know somehow Make include camps, more you know yeah. like pick for the kids. I, I pick teams, do something, include mm-hmm. more people, include outside groups, get more conversation around it. All Star Weekend should be this whole huge thing. They should set up like a mini town there or something. Like go all out. That, that's what I'm saying. If you're gonna do it, do it right. Don't make it something impactful because you're going to ruin somebody's chance. Like you said, you, right. you ruin your chances of, you know, a team. It's just, it, it's not right. So final thoughts here on the, uh, regarding the All-Star game. Baseball built on tradition and it's very conservative yes. in the way that they, they preserve their rules. And within the All-Star game for them, 
it's showcasing their top level talent and we saw and it's great for the game and you get the fans involved with a fan vote and I know there's some flaws there because hmm. <laughs> you scuff because um, Brent Dober started at second and you kind of made an argument that uh, David Murphy or Daniel Murphy could have been there and then you have Addison Russell at short and it's like okay but Corey Seager where you at you know what I mean <laughs> so it, it, there, there are some complications there but it, it showcases uh, young talent the best players against the best players obviously that's something good for the game but as uh, th- this new collective bargaining bargaining agreement is put into place here, we look at some substantial changes regarding the disabled list. They changed it from 15 days to 10. And for me, my immediate reaction was like, awesome. Because we saw it last year, you know, 15 days, you have to make a commitment for a player to be out for a certain amount of time. Now, yep. that's that's that hurts a team, obviously, because they have to make a decision. Are they going to fill that roster spot with somebody called uh, called up from AAA? Now, say for a guy like Jason Hayward, for example, he made that insane diving catch up against the wall in San Francisco, hurt his shoulder, but it wasn't, he didn't hurt himself enough to the point where he had to be put on the 15 day DL. So he was considered day to day, and they, the Cubs were forced to be played uh, undermanned for, I don't know, four or five games. With the, with the incorporation of the DL of only 10 games now, you can avoid that situation. Also, it's kind of interesting the way teams kind of attack this uh, specifically. I don't know. I'm curious to to hear your thoughts on the change from 15 to 10. So I I, I hate to to be this guy again, uh, but <laughs> IR DL it's kind of dumb, right? Like, why do you have to make this weird decision of all right, we have this much time where this player has to be out? Is it worth putting him on there, or do I want him to just sit on my roster where maybe I can play him at some point sooner, and it might be risky for his health, right. but if I do it a certain other time, then he's out for too long. You know, it just, for the the sake of the team, for the sake of entertainment, for the sake of the health of the actual player, why does it have to be this? It has to be 10 days. It has to be 15 days. It has to be seven games. It has to be the whole season. Like, just let the person be out for the time they need to be out, and you can have someone in their spot. And then once they're ready to go, that person is off your roster or back to you know well, then to your developmental it, it team. It just gets manipulated. Which I think it, I don't really think it's that big of an issue though. I mean, if if it's like someone who is a lower level talent, it's not making that big of a difference. If it's someone who's a top level talent, you want that guy back on the field as soon as possible. Yeah. You want him back in your roster. So like, sure, you can you can play around with it and stuff like that, but. I just don't see why you have to make it this extra thing of like, all right, there's this many games. Does he fit this perfectly? No. Okay, well, then we got to look at what else we can do. You know, and it's just, I don't know. To me, it's an extra thing that's not really needed. Just let the best players play when they're ready. I sort of want to agree with you on this. It's too simple to be like good, but at the same time, like there's there's really not a huge problem. I think I'm adding a minimum days out would probably be the only change I'd make to that, Mark. Like Mm -hmm. if you can't play for three days like make it something small so it's like all right we can't flip flop people up and down like depending on the game but like you have to be hurt for at least three games that's fine like three days whatever I, i'm fine with a three-day minimum and then it's from there on it's totally flexible based on the player's health I, i'm with you on that i think simplicity's sake and it, it's a win for every party involved yeah yeah and you know and it's i think the thing too is if you're if a worry is flipping guys from your, you know, your your farm teams up and down and stuff like that. You're going to play the matchups. Yeah, like you're going for playing the match, but you, you mess around with your roster so much, that's not going to really work in your benefit. See, baseball is all about, like, continuity. When yeah. you get rolling, you get rolling. You don't change anything. You wear those same socks. You, yeah, you, you wear those boxers. Anything. You know, you do the same routine. So, I don't know. I, I don't see a lot of abuse coming, but I think that just adding in a minimum would be great, and then call it, man. That's... You should uh, toss in that suggestion to the CBA next time around. Right, we'll I be should. here in a couple of years. That's an interesting perspective. I actually wasn't thinking about that because I feel like having structure within um, injuries is very important to the game because it just continues. Obviously, mm. the kind of, you know, I don't know. But uh, I want to move on, though, to the final kind of change that I want to bring up. I, there was a uh, conversation about an international draft. It didn't happen. Um, but really something that was a major difference that restricted free agents uh, over the last five years, the recent uh, agreement regarded quali- qualifying offer and what uh, teams would have to give up if they did sign a top-level free agent. So really what happens now is if a team, uh, say a player declines a qualifying offer, like last year Dexter Fowler, had, or, I'm sorry, this year had a qualifying offer, declined it, and that would cost a team, if it's not protected, remember, 
first 10 draft picks are protected. Anybody outside the top 10 lose that draft pick if they decide to sign a top-level free agent. That's done. That They don't lose any uh, that value anymore, and that that helps small market teams who rely specifically on, on obviously, young talent. Now, you look at uh, another aspect, too. They increase the luxury uh, threshold. Now, remember, Major League Baseball doesn't have a cap. They have a luxury tax. So if you're above it, like the Dodgers, you're going to have to pay. So right now, you're looking at uh, a change specifically. I have it right here. It, it, gets, it gets complicated. So a player declines a qualifying offer, and he becomes a free agent. He, he, signs a, he goes on to sign a team, and uh, as a result, instead of losing a first-round pick, they lose, if they're above the th- uh, luxury tax, they lose a second and a fifth. So, I mean, they're not losing a first-round pick, but still, you're losing draft picks. If they're below it, you lose a third. So there's still some discrepancies there, and we, I just wanted to bring that to um, the attention because that's, that's something that'll change the dynamic of free agency. Like immediately, yeah. you're going to have high level free agents not restricted, and teams too not restricted by this uh, compensation, and that hurt guys like Dexter Fowler specifically last year. I use him as an example because it's the easiest one. He had he could have obviously made 50, 60 mil last year, and he was only offered what 30 yeah. by the Orioles, and then that helped the Cubs win a World Series because he ended up staying there. So interesting, interesting stuff here. The collective bargaining agreement, and that in and of itself, now that they came together on a deal. The offseason can progress, 